Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning again. Good morning to another, to you. Welcome to another edition of Inspirational Wednesdays. Today is April, August, can I say April, I'm sorry, August the 31st, 2016. My name is Pastor Al Kennan. It's my pleasure, it's my privilege, it's my honor to be here with you today to facilitate this call. Last week, uh, we weren't able to have the call because I had to be go to Ohio for my the intensive in my doctoral program. But I am back this week and I am ready to pray. I hope you're ready to pray. I hope you're ready to seek God and seek His face and to seek whatever God's will is for us today. I trust and believe that God is doing some wonderful things in our life. I trust and believe that God is making some things happen and that as we continue to seek Him, that as we continue to love upon Him, that as we continue to submit ourselves to Him, our God will make more of Himself available, that He will literally shower us with His grace, His mercy, His love, His presence, His, His, His anointing, His favor, that we will experience the fullness of life, the abundance of life as we give more of ourselves to him and that in return as we experience more of, of him that God we want to give more back to you and to serve you as you've called. Amen. I pray that the last 14 days have been blessful for you. I also pray that if you've had to deal with anything in those 14 days God has been on your side helping you work it out and I trust and believe that today we have the prayer requests quests necessary to raise a guy so that there will be a major move in our lives. I believe we have the praise reports of what God has done in those last 14 days and how he's lifted us up and how he's blessed us. And I just believe we have some words of encouragement, some testimonies and some witnesses that are going to help people uh, change their minds about some things, help people understand and know that our God is indeed on the throne working things out. With that said here, let us begin with our opening word of prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right now, God, thanking you for this day, for this is the day you made. We are rejoicing. We are glad in it. God, we pray at this moment, at this hour, at this time, God, that God, you will have, let your spirit have its way, that your spirit, spirit will rest, rule, and abide on this call, that your spirit will guide us and and and. and and informing us what it is that you would have us pray about, that your spirit would touch our hearts and sympathize and empathize us to what persons are dealing with, what persons are going through, what persons are wrestling with, that your spirit, Lord, will ensure that your will is accomplished during this call. And God, we praise your name, God, for loving us so much that, God, you felt it not robbery to spend this time with us. You felt it not wrong to be personally present on this call with us, receiving our prayer requests, our praise reports, our prayers. And Lord, we pray that as we are lifting up our prayer requests, our praise reports, our prayers, our words of encouragement, and our testimony witnesses, that God, you are moving instantaneously in our lives, that God, you're moving immediately, that God, you're on the job right now as we're lifting up the prayer requests, so that God, we experience a tangible, uh, cognizable change, shift, transformation in our lives, so that God, your will is done. We seek the we are we are able to receive a witness and someone experiences your glory. Now God bless us, keep us, and never leave us. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Everyone, if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. We're going to look at chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. The New Revised Standard Version reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, your, is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. 
Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and you are, when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you <coughs> excuse me, a land with fine, large cities that you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant, and when you have eaten your field, take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Thus far, the word of God. The title of our devotional this morning is Loving God Entirely. Loving God Entirely. Recently, God and I have spent some time together discussing the notion of all. If anyone here on this call attended our exaltation service this past weekend at Epiphany Christian Church, our Heavenly Father distinguished the either-or perspective from the all perspective. He taught us that one perspective is just opposed against the other perspective. We human beings live both in society and the larger world where, there, where more times than not, we're forced to choose either this option or that option. We're so inundated with the either-or perspective that we approach God and Christian discipleship with this perspective on our hearts and our spirits. The problem with utilizing this either-or perspective during our faith walks is that it cuts against the grain in terms of faith. Faith doesn't see a predicament or a tribulation as a situation where we choose among multiple options. Rather, faith requires us to trust the Lord, believing that everything we need to overcome the instant predicament or tribulation he will provide. Our God requires us to make all of ourselves available to him, not a part, not a portion, not this percentage of us set aside over in the corner for the Lord's uses. All of us is what the Lord God requires. That's what we must give to him. As I said, the Lord God Almighty has continued to speak to my spirit about this all perspective. And as I was preparing today's devotional, our God took me directly to our scriptorial focus. There in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find Moses instructing this new generation of Israelites before they enter the promised land. <clears throat> what And what do you know? Moses begins that instruction with the all perspective of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. He informs this new generation of Israelites that God requires all from them. They are required to love the Lord God with all they had. Moses speaks about how they were to love Yahweh with their hearts, their souls, and their strength. The idea was that there was nothing that the Israelites uh, were permitted to withhold from God. Everything they were, everything they did, and everything they had were to be made immediately available to their Heavenly Father. God's instruction for us this morning is that he requires us to, to love him completely. We should utilize every little bit of us to love our Heavenly Father entirely. He wants all of us and requires us to give all of us to Him. Looking at our scriptorial focus, it's easy to discern this truth. The first thing we see is loving God eternally requires that we submit every aspect of ourselves to Him. Loving God entirely requires us to submit every aspect of ourselves to him. From the start, Moses' instruction to the Israelites contains a submission requirement. When he commands the Israelites to love the Lord their God with all of their hearts, souls, and strength, the instruction is to submit themselves to God to be used as he sees fit. If we are loving someone or something with all our hearts, souls, and strength, we're literally giving to them our everything. We're turning over to this person or thing all that we have, 
Everything that makes us uniquely us is now in their permission and under their control. Is that not submission? I argue that this understanding of submission is a primary reason why persons, both men and women, have difficulty submitting to other persons. There is this realization that submission includes relinquishing our power to choose for ourselves as well as the ability to, ability to control how we let third parties affect us. Living in a society that, that stresses the importance of the self as well as stressing the, our freedoms and the importance of both possessing and exercising control over oneself, submission is a very, very hard thing for us to do. Losing the power of choice and the perceived value that such power possesses is unacceptable to many of us. That's why we have no problem declaring that Christ Jesus is our Savior, but hesitate to make the equally important declaration that He is also our Lord. The Savior aspect of Jesus is acceptable to us because we all recognize the necessity of spiritual salvation. However, we balk at the idea that he's also our Lord because the implication of such a declaration is explicit. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. Instead, we belong to him as su and as such, we don't have the final say-so anymore over our lives. But if we're going to love God entirely, we're required to submit everything that is uniquely us to him, including our power and ability. Yes, God knows as we stand here right right here today, we have no clue what will happen tomorrow. And, it, and what if we relinquish all power and control this afternoon and tomorrow morning something unfortunate happens in our lives? My brothers and my sisters, this is where faith come in, comes in. We have to believe that our God will never leave us nor forsake us and no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper. We have to believe that right now, even as we relinquish control over our lives to God, God is in full control. God is working it out. God is making it happen. That God knows what's going to happen. That God has already started working on a solution. That God has already started working and building a bridge over troubled waters that God has already started opening that door, that window, that, that new opening, that new portal in your life so that you will experience his fullness, his grace, and his mercy, that there will be nothing that was, is lacking. We have to trust that just because we don't have the foresight of the future, that that doesn't mean that our God is as limited visually and mentally as we are. We have to understand that God is so far in our future that right now we're in his past all right so the first requirement in order to love God entirely is that we submit every aspect of ourselves to him the second thing that God requires from us is loving him entirely requires that we constantly and continually dwell on him and his will for our lives Loving God entirely requires that we constantly and continually dwell on Him and His will for our lives. Personally, I find it interesting that immediately after Moses instructed the Israelites to love the Lord their God with all of their heart, souls, and strength, he then instructs them to spend every waking hour dwelling on God's will for their lives. He instructs them to talk continually about God's will for them as expressed through Torah. He instructs them to teach their children God's will. Moses instructs this new generation of Israelites to write God's law on their hands, their feet, and bodies, as well as their fences, doorposts, and the walls of their homes. It's clear that Moses believes that there should, be ne there should never be a time when the children of God aren't thinking about or otherwise meditating on God and his will for their lives. I understand why Moses gave this generation, this new generation of Israelites this instruction. They were about to enter into a whole new world where they were going to where there were going to be things, ideas, and concepts that would fight for space and influence within their lives and or minds. He didn't want to see this generation of Israelites fall away from Yahweh like their parents' generation had. 
Moses believed that if these new Israelites spent every waking hour with their minds focused on God, they would avoid the trappings and pitfalls that their parents fell prey to. Consider for a moment, would we, all the influence we encounter on a daily basis. We can't go a full 24 hours without something, something, or some company attempting to persuade us that whatever it is that they offer is what we need. Women are being told that their beauty isn't beautiful enough. They are inundated with beauty products that stress that true beauty can only be attained by using these companies' products. Men are inundated with the perception that tangible strength is extremely important. In fact, it's a necessity. Most car commercials tickle the man's self-perception of strength. He's stronger because he owns and drives a certain automobile. Life is more successful because of the car he drives. Check this out. Beer commercials stress that consumption of their product imbues the drinker with social acceptance and sexual virility. Every time we turn around, we're smacked directly in the face with yet another influence and or temptation. Knowing this, how do we carve out space so that God can spend some time with us? Are we intentional about our fellowship with the Lord? Have we set aside a dedicated time each day where we spend both quantitative and qualitative time interacting with him? Or do we, or do we simply uh, give God, get meet with God, give God whatever time we have, however long we have it, whenever it occurs? In other words, is, it, is our interaction with God happenstance? God wants us to consider this proposition. The more time we spend focused on his will for our lives, the more we will see God's love, favor, and anointing manifest themselves in our lives. Honestly, how can it not be so? The more we spend time in fellowship with God, the more inclined he is to reveal more of himself to us. The more we make ourselves available to the Lord, the more he actually moves mountains for us. The more we serve him, the more he enables us to do. There is a direct correlation between what we offer God and what he gives us in return. Put in nothing, get nothing out. Put only something in, only get something out. However, if we put everything in, we get everything out. Where do we each want to land on the scale? I don't know about you. But I want everything that God has for me. I want every blessing. I want every uh, bit of anointing. I want every bit of favor. I want every opportunity. I want every uh, 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 ounce of love. I want every moment of nurturing. I want everything from God. Therefore, if that's what I want, then I'm required to give him everything so that he will give me everything in return. Now, don't get me wrong. This, I'm not talking about tit for tat. Because truly, there's nothing we can do that can uh, that 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 is the polar opposite or the equal what God does for us. But what I am saying is that the more we submit to God, the more we give ourselves to God, God is inclined to allow us to be exposed to more of Him, to more what makes Him God, more what makes Him the Lord, more what makes Him. Yahweh and what makes him the creator of all things. The more we give, the more he gives. The last uh, requirement here for loving God entirely requires us to always remember just how good God's been to us and the favor he showered over our lives. Loving God entirely requires us to always remember just how good he's been to us and the favor he showered over our lives. Recently, God showed me just how fickle memory and legacy are. I had been away from the everyday hustle and bustle of the local state courthouse. As the Lord has opened the door to pastoring, he's also begun closing the door to lawyering. Every now and then, he sends me a small legal matter to handle for someone. But on this day, I had to assist someone with a misdemeanor. I went to the courthouse, and as usually is the case, there aren't enough DAs for the assigned courtroom. 
There are there are the there is there at I'm sorry, there at the DA's table was a young prosecutor working herself into a frenzy, trying to manage the courtroom by herself. As she was working, I noticed that I didn't recognize many of the defense attorneys in the courtroom. I knew none of the public defenders. I vaguely recall one or two private defense attorneys. For the most part, I knew very, very little of the county criminal defense bar. When I finally got a chance to speak to the DA, she interrupted me and said, What's your name again? I was startled. I recalled a time where everyone knew who I was. I was always greeted with, Hello, Mr. Kennan, what can I do for your client today? Now it was, by the way, what's your name again? The Lord showed me that the courthouse moved on in my absence. And in moving on, whatever memory and legacy that I had, that I had established up, uh, up until that point had quickly faded away. The danger before this new generation of Israelites is that they didn't know their history with God. None of them were born when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. None of them experienced the glory of God as he inflicted the ten plagues on Pharaoh and all of Egypt. None of them were present when the Lord used the Red Sea as both a means of escape and a weapon. None of them were present when the Lord God kept their parents' generation and provided for them as they traveled through the wilderness from Egypt to the Promised Land. They had only recently come on the scene and they lacked this historical record with God. Moses was afraid that if this generation of Israelites weren't made aware of their history of God and taught how to maintain this history at the forefront of their minds, then they would stray away from God and lose a special relationship they shared with them. To prevent this, Moses specifically instructed them to remember how the Lord God Almighty had brought them to this point. He also wanted them to use this memory as a foundation of faith as they move forward with God in the future. Moses did not want this generation to turn away from God, nor did he want them to make the same sinful mistakes that their parents made. He honestly wanted the Lord to bless them, and remembering who and what the Lord was in them was a means of ensuring that this occurred. Each and every one of us on this call this morning has a very unique history with our Heavenly Father. He has performed all kinds of miracles in our personal lives. He's provided what we've needed and he's protected us from harm both seen and unseen as we've moved forward in life. And the amazing thing is that while the Lord has blessed us individually, he's also blessed us collectively as a people. We've literally witnessed the body of Christ make significant strides in terms of both our Christian discipleship and stewardship. This conference call itself is, a proof, is proof positive of this truth. And as good as things have been for us, God promises us that we'll experience bigger and better. There's a promised land for each of us to enter into. What we've experienced thus far in our life is simply our journeys through the wilderness. Many of us are mere moments away from stepping out of the wilderness and into a land flowing with milk and honey. Our Heavenly Father has let other persons build the very tools and instrumentalities that He's destined for us to use to His glory. We will reap harvests that we didn't actually plant and sow ourselves. We will live in homes and enjoy the refined, precious aspects of life. What our God doesn't want us to experience is us forgetting about him when he permits us to reach the top of the mountain. Memory about what all he's brought us through and brought us from should keep us grounded in the reality that everything we have and everything we are are precious gifts from God. He wants us to love him entirely. He wants to love us to love him with, with our all, with our complete being, with every ounce, with every centimeter, with every, every speck, with every aspect of our lives. He wants us to dwell in the fact that he has never, has never failed. He's never faltered. He's never come short. He's, ne he's never been defeated. He's never been overcome. He's never been run away. That our God has been successful at every step of the way and this memory this truth this record should encourage us it should serve as a foundation of faith for us as we move forward with him in our lives we have to love God entirely 
And these are some of the ways that we do it. Not forgetting what he's done for us, constantly dwelling on, on his will for our life, and literally submitting everything we have to him. Amen, amen. Here, let's have a word of prayer for our devotional. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we thank you at this time on this day, God, for what you do, how you do, when you do, what you do, God. And we, God, we pray that God, that during this devotional, that during this moment, that during this time of sharing, God, that you have already started speaking to where we are, that what we're going through, that God, for many of us, we can attest that we are in the wilderness, that we are traveling from slavery to freedom. But God, we're not there yet. And at some point, God, we are on the verge, on the cusp of actually entering into the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey, this land with houses, God, and and and, and crop, God, and opportunity, God, and, 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 and valuables, God, and blessings, God, that these things are waiting for us. And God, you want us to have a certain aspect, a certain mindset, a certain belief before we enter into there. And that belief is you want us to give you all of us to surrender, submit, and basically provide to you, to hand to you all of us, God, so that together we may walk hand in hand into the, our promised lands as master, as servant, as Lord, as follower, as as father, as children, as God and people. That God, you want us to do this so that God, the people who are in the land, get a sterling, shining example of what it means to live in faith, to exercise faith, and to be persons chosen personally by you to represent you in this world. God, we thank you, and God, we honor and we uh, and, and we glorify you for helping us perfect our relationship with you, helping us perfect our love for you, helping us, God, do that which you call us to do. Now, God, it's time for us to switch gears. It's time for us to get busy praying. It's time for us to trust and believe, God, that as we intercede on other persons' behalf, past as well as our own to ask God we allow uh, you to have your way in this place that God not only are you going to bless us but you're going to bless every single person connected to us. That, God, you're going to use us as a prism to flow your blessings uh, uh, your blessings to us, uh, uh, to others through us. And, God, we trust and believe that as you're doing that, God, the kingdom grows. The kingdom expands. The kingdom becomes what you would have it to be. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. It's time for us to begin uh, our, our our the prayer section of our call. We are praying that uh, God that God is right here with us. That God is ready to receive our prayer requests. We're praying that you have prayer requests to give God. We're praying God that you have your praise reports about what God has done for you, what God is doing for you, what God continues to do for you. And we believe that together we're going to experience God in such a way this morning that we're going to leave this call encouraged, we're going to leave this call empowered and edified, and we're going to leave this call, call uh, 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 enabled to be the disciples and stewards that God has called us to be. Uh, amen. So let's do this. Let's shift our gears. Let's get in prayer more right now. As usual, as we always do, if you have a prayer request, prayer, praise report, words of encouragement, testimony, witness that you would like to share, all you have to do is to give us your name, where you're calling from. If you're worried, I don't know why you would be, but if you're worried that someone will recognize your voice or recognize what you, who you are by what you share, you can just tell us where you're calling from. You don't have to give us your name. However, we want you to take advantage of this time, this space, this place that God has carved out for us this morning because this is a place where we all have come to pray and to be prayed for. 
to lift up one another. No one here is here to get your business, to be in your business, to be to gossip. Each one of us is going through something. Each one of us is fighting something. Each one of us is struggling to keep our heads above the water. And honestly, tr just trying to wade in the water takes so much time and energy that we don't have the time to be gossiping about what you're going through. Instead, we're more concerned about trying to get to you to help you wade in the water, to help you keep your head above the water than we are trying to find out your business. So with that said, we hope and pray that you would trust the process and allow God to move through you to share with us what it is we you want us to pray with you about so that together we can lift your prayer request to God. Let me say this for begin because I need to kill a devil right quick. The devil is whispering in someone's ear saying, wait a second, y'all declare that God is omniscient. He's all knowing. Why do you need to actually articulate what's going on in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your world, if he already knows what, what it is? Well, there is a requirement in scripture that we articulate what it is that we need God to do. It's not an indication that God doesn't know. And rather, it's an indication that God requires a, just a little bit from us in order for him to do what he needs to do. God says, you have not because you you, you seek if not. The, you, the door is not open because you not you don't knock. Uh, there's a requirement that we articulate what we, what we want God to do so that he can do it for us. With that said, here, let me move out the way. If you have a prayer request, praise report, prayer, words of encouragement, testimony, witness that you'd like to share with us, give us your name. Where are you calling from? We'll go from there. Good morning. This is Camille calling from Maryland. Hi, Camille. How are you doing? Good. 